saya Ram, saya Dr. Jim Sai. Welcome to Face to Face in Singapore. It's a real pleasure to have you face to face meeting a global audience in that sense. You know. What I want to ask you at the onset itself is as a Buddhist and as a Sai devotee there are values in all religions. Buddhism has got the five precepts, Bhagwan has given five values. Do they merge or is there more value to what you're doing with Bhagwan's teachings? Um Bhagwan's teachings have given me greater understanding of Buddhism. So it's really uh, something that helps me to be a better B- Buddhist. Um and this is happening all over the world where Swami's teachings will help people of all religions to be a better uh, religious person in their own religion because we do not uh, try to change anybody swami said when you are christian be the best christian when you are buddhist be the best buddhist when you are muslim be the best muslim i agree with you as a buddhist myself i've become a better buddhist and so have my so yes. my wife and my children uh, because of bhagwan's given a greater understanding of inside and the way he talks about the buddha and lord jesus christ or even people like lincoln every now and then he gives examples and gives you right. different insights mm-hmm. altogether you see yes what are the three greatest transformations that have happened to you after being a sai devotee well um let me say that swami has put me through many workshops <laughs> to transform me okay um naturally uh, the very first meeting is very important for me because when i f- first arrived uh, some 24 years ago in puttaparthi my first sight of swami and i was a long way away okay because uh, it's birthday celebration and i couldn't get any where close to swami uh, it was quite some distance away but when he came out for darshan suddenly i was shivering i was crying and uh, i felt there's a lot, lot of light and energy entering my body okay and that was a real transformation i knew that my search has ended I, there's no longer any need for me to search anywhere else because i was always on the search i was always trying to find a guru or somebody who could teach me um and uh i was not satisfied um throughout my life really because i met many um teachers many yogis but and ajans yes and ajans yes acharyas <laughs> um but it was when i i met swami that i knew that my journey has ended what clicked just seeing one darshan from a distance yes and something completely soaked and clicked and touched your soul um, sort of the inner being of your core of your heart what was it about this looking at our guru looking at swami what is it that that, that entered you well physically i felt a lot of energy entering Uh, that there was light entering my my body and i was shaking shivering and crying uh, but it was um, peaceful very peaceful and uh, that's i just felt that that's it <laughs> there is a first transformation yes uh, second and third well uh, the second transformation uh, swami wanted to Uh, make sure that i no, i'm no longer attached to worldly things at that time i was very successful businessman i had many businesses i was shareholders uh, in many companies i was president of companies and suddenly i lost everything just overnight something happened uh, people turned away they uh, some of them just took the shares away uh, all kinds of uh, happenings and suddenly i was i had no business i had nothing okay so at that time i received a telegram from puttaparthi so i was told to go to to see swami 
and I was to give a talk for teachers in Buddha Party. So Were you involved in education then? Well, not really, but um, you mentioned business. You see, that's why. Yes, I, I was in business more than anything else. But before that, I was teaching at university, so I kept up uh, lecturing. Um, but in my spare time, okay. But mostly, I was concentrating on business. What subjects were you lecturing on at that time? Um, well, I still did some lectures in engineering, in science, uh, environment. But mostly, it has become EHV, human values. Okay, it's already changing uh, towards human values, education, and so on. And so, I went to see Swami. I bought the cheapest ticket that was available um, because I was in some financial difficulty at that time. So I went to Puttaparthi and um, I gave that le lecture. Then Swami called me, okay, to a private interview. It was not a normal darshan, a normal interview, but he asked me to go to to his room, and um, uh, so I, I went there, and that was an opportunity for me to complain to Swami. You know why is all this happening? Swami put up his hand. I know, I know, you've lost all your business. You are in great financial difficulty. I just want to test you. That's what he said. And uh, of course, that was very touching when he said he wants to test me. And I realized that everything is Swami. Swami is planning something, doing something. And uh, that was a real transformation uh, on uh, for me because I realized that it's all Swami and I I, I should not be attached to anything. What he can, what he gives you, he can take away. So um, he has taken it away. And uh, eventually, when I got back uh, to to Bangkok, everything returned to normal. I was given back everything. I was president of companies and so on. But this time, I was not attached to uh, all these companies anymore. What was your third transformation? Well, Swami had to get rid of my ego. <laughs> so, so uh, first detachment from worldly things, okay, uh, and then he has to get rid of my ego so that I could work uh, in his divine plan. So uh, the third transformation is when he um, asked me to meet him in Brindavan. And there was only myself, the warden, and my uh, and, and Swami, just the so three of us. Murthy was the warden yes, there. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, Swami said, "I want you to come back um, in about two or three weeks' time to give a talk to the uh, summer camp. He's going to have summer camp in Brindavan, so he asked me to be a, a speaker. So I, I was thinking, how could I come back?" I've used up all my budget <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for traveling. So Swami looked at me knowingly and he said, well, only if you can. You know, he said very nicely, just to make me feel a little bit more happy. Uh, I went back to Thailand and a ticket was waiting for me. Okay, But it was for another uh, trip to uh, Assisi in, in, in Italy. So I went there, uh, at least I have the ticket, and then I went immediately to the um, travel agent and said, please change the ticket so that it, can, it will pass through um, India. Uh, India, through Bangalore, and then from there I travel on to, to, um, to Italy. And amazingly, he was able to change my ticket, okay? Um, it was business class all the way, so and he, he was able to arrange business class uh, travel all the way through. Okay, so I was able to go to uh, Brindavan to to Bangalore um, with no problem. So at that time, I started to have a lot of feeling. Oh, uh, I'm so great. <laughs> uh, I started to have a lot of ego. You see. Um, 
So when I went to to um, uh, to Bangalore, I expected that there would be some cars waiting for me to collect me, and of course there's no car. So I took a taxi and I went to to the ashram in Whitefield, and I arrived uh, in the evening, and I tried to get inside. I told the Sevadal, you know, I'm a guest of Swami. Um, he's invited me to come. And the Sevadal said, no way, we don't allow anybody to go in. Okay. So uh, I tried very hard, but still the Sevadal insisted. Um, then a crowd was gathering outside, and they were whispering, they were saying, Swami's coming out, Swami's coming out in his car. So I said, well, now Swami will see me, okay? So uh, the car came out, and Swami was looking the other way. He did not look looked in my direction, okay? So I have no other solution, so I went to get a room. In those days, uh, you don't have hotels, you don't have um, uh, Gokulam and so on, where, where you can go and stay outside the ashram. So I I got a very uh, small room, and it's full of mosquitoes. I was bitten all night long. You had a volu- involuntary uh, blood donation. Yes, <laughs> involuntary. I suffered a great deal, but by the time morning came, I became humble once again. Uh, I realized that it's all my ego expecting a lot of things. Uh, for myself, feeling that I, I'm invited guest, I'm important person, all this just disappeared overnight. I went in the ashram as a normal person, uh, not expecting any welcome, uh, and I went amongst the crowd um, for a, a darshan in the morning. Okay, and then at that time the. Warden saw me and and he said, "Where have you been? We've been expecting you. Uh, we thought you were coming yesterday. Where were you? <laughs> we already arranged a room for you. You see." So uh, I said, "Yes." I smiled, <laughs> um, realizing that this is all Swami. Uh, he wants to break up my ego, get rid of my ego. I should be humble. So um, after that. I was welcomed. I was. I had a nice room, and then that same morning, I was told to go and speak in the auditorium in front of Swami for one and one and one hour, fifteen minutes. What was your talk on? It was about the uh, the various levels of consciousness. Buddhist. Basically, it's 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 Buddhist. Dhamma, yeah. But it's really universal. Buddhism is somewhat universal anyway. So I was talking about uh, the, the subconscious, the, the conscious mind, the, the higher consciousness. Uh, and Swami listened uh, for one hour and 15 minutes at that time. So I was very happy, very peaceful. And I realized that it was a mistake expecting to be welcomed, expecting so many things. and. Uh, it was all part of my ego, so that was the the big transformation for me, getting rid of my ego. So you spoke about the Brahmanas, the attainment of jnanas in Buddhism and so on. Yes. But Buddhism didn't seem to have uh, given you great satisfaction because you're still searching for acharyas, for gurus, and so on and so forth. Or was Buddhism's freedom that gave you the opportunity to look out well, as a Buddhist, um, we we feel that as long as there were one, one million people, there would be one million religions. <laughs> that is part of Buddhism, where there's a lot of religious tolerance. So I was f- quite free to look around, um, still remaining a Buddhist. Okay, and um, everything is an addition to my understanding. So it's part of the search. Um, which I felt was part of my Buddhist uh, training. Lord Gautama Buddha never spoke about God the Creator. He never entered into that realm. But now, of course, in the Sai domain, God plays a large role. How do you uh, accommodate this? 
Well, um, when I was searching and searching, I realized that finally you have to go within and find out the truth. And that is Buddhism. Okay. Um, Basically Vipassana and so on. Yes. And uh, by so doing, you discover the truth. And the truth is one. There's no difference. And I, uh, you, you start to realize that by definition, truth is God. Truth is something that does not change. Uh, what is true today must be true tomorrow, and therefore it will be true to infinity. And because it's true today, it must have been true yesterday, and so on. So it goes back uh, in time. So there's no beginning, no end. That what is that's truth. Now the only definition that goes along with that is God. God does not change. God existed before um, there is creation. God ex will exist, continue to exist after creation. Now in Buddhism, uh, the only definition that fits in with that is nirvana. Nirvana is a state whereby there is no birth, no death. There is no change. It's a constant peace. Um, it never changes. Okay, nirvana. So really, nirvana and God is one and the same. That's how I feel. So my own interpretation is that uh, by reaching nirvana, by finding out about nirvana, we are finding about God. Buddha gave uh, total freedom of thought when he said, "Ehi pasiko openaiko pachatang vihitabo vinyohiti" in Pali, in his own language, which means, "Come, examine, see for yourself." Don't believe because the Buddha himself says it. That's not the way with Baba, is it? Well, Swami also tells us, come and witness, come and see for yourself. Okay, he, he does tell he does tell everybody that, um, and Swami has never forced us to believe in anything. Um, he also uh, teaches us to to go within to discover the divinity that is within you. Uh, he's not asking us to discover God that is outside. It's something that is in our own mind, in our own heart, that is something that we have to discover. You take one step towards me, I'll take ten, I'll take hundred. Bring all your problems to me, and I'll give you joy in return. Buddha didn't say that. No, but um, uh, it's the same as giving up everything, be completely detached. When you give up all your problems, everything to Swami, it's detachment. And uh, certainly the Lord Buddha asks us to be detached from all problems, all difficulties, um, give up everything. We talked when we began this interview about the three greatest transformations of your life. What are the three greatest challenges you're facing now? Um, once you start to have full faith in Bhagawan, then really there's no more challenges. Um, there may seem to be difficulties, but... What's but, the difference between difficulty and challenge? Um, difficulties is something that um, you think for yourself, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, a challenge is something that we need to overcome, something that we need to be able to go over. Um, it's, it's something that Swami may have set up for us so that we can learn from it. Okay. Um, so when we realize that it's all Swami, then no longer is it an obstacle to us because we welcome everything. Everything is done for a purpose. There's always a reason behind it. Uh, therefore, we face it and we don't think it's an obstacle anymore. We smile, we laugh, we enjoy all the experiences that comes to us. So it's a completely different life. But I'm sure you understand <clears throat> when I say it's more easier said than done for normal mortals like us. 
that we take it, we smile and we fall with the tide, we rise with it, we take a tsunami, see half a million people washed off and think it is all karma. When Bhagavan himself says, not a leaf moves without my will. If that is the case, where do you place such catastrophic sequences that are happening around in the world today? Well, um, as we know, um, the world is coming to a crisis. Um, that is why we have the avatar, um, three three avatars in su succession. Okay, we have uh, Sai Baba of Shirdi. Now we have Sai Baba, Satya Sai Satya Sai Baba, and now uh, and then the next one will be Prema Sai. And we know, Swami has said, that in the time of Premasai, there will be complete peace in the world. Now, in order to have complete peace in the world, and that is only uh, 15 years from now, when we will start to, or 16 years from now, uh, when Swami will leave this body, and then we'll have the Premasai era soon after that. Um, so very soon we'll have peace in the world. And I really believe that that will happen. Now, what in, are the indications? Um, well, look at tsunami. Okay, yes, we do have a lot of deaths. Two hundred thousand people died as a result of the tsunami, but it's brought so many people together. People came to their rescue. People came to help those who are suffering. Uh, and help came from all over the world. Um, so through disasters, there's a change of heart. You know, many people in Thailand that I observed, they just want to help, they want to give, they want to, uh, they feel that compassion for those who are suffering, okay? Um, so through disasters like this, that people start to come together, they have greater love, love starts to emerge. Just as in the World Trade Center, 11th September, uh, the, uh, the New Yorkers in those days, they would not even talk to each other. They don't know each other, they don't talk, they don't discuss. But after the, that event, they started to talk, they want to help, they want to do something, they don't want to have this happening again. Okay, so, um, Disasters are, are ways of helping all of us to realize that we must learn to love one another, we must learn to serve one another. Um, uh, so in a way, in order to come to that peace, the final peace, um, we may have to go through a lot of uh, difficulties. This is a baptism of fire. Yes. A part of the beginning of the peace that you're talking about? Yes, but it doesn't have to be. Um, uh, if we have love now, then there will be peace tomorrow. And we only need a critical mass of people that have enough love. In other words, some 50%. Okay, Once you have a little bit more love than hatred, the whole world will be changed overnight. We don't have to get rid of all the hatred, okay? But we need just more love energy than than energy of hate. Um, then the world will change. So what we need to do is come up to that critical mass of people. Um, and um, in the meantime, if we don't love one another, then through our own action, we are creating a lot of problem for ourselves. Uh, for example, we um, uh, we create a lot of problem in the environment. We burn up fossil fuels. We are creating creating global warming, and now we we know that there's a lot of um, climatic changes taking place. The sea level is rising. The uh, ice in the polar regions are melting. And because the level of the sea is rising, uh, the mass of water over the Pacific Ocean um, 
there's a greater weight there, okay? And so the earth is no longer balanced. And because of that, we need to have movements of the plates, uh, plates uh, around the, the globe so that we can have uh, stability once again in the rotation of the earth. And therefore, we have more earthquakes than ever before. We have uh, more problems. Maybe new land will come up, some land will go down and so on. There's a report published uh, in today's paper yes. which talks about the University of Columbia and Harvard getting together and doing models and predicting that the polar are all melting, as you've mentioned right. just now. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a two point, there'll be a six meter rise of sea level right. before the end of the century. And also a 2.5 degrees Celsius global warming, which is disastrous to even think about it. As right. a scientist and as a spiritual person, what's your reaction to that report? Well, I, I, I read the report in the newspapers as well, and it says 4 degrees Celsius <laughs> increase. Oh, it says uh, 2 point in the Singapore papers. Oh, yeah, I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, just just 1 degree is already a big disaster. Um, another 1 degree increase uh, in temperature would mean uh, at least um, uh, 1 meter rise in, in, in the sea level. And... Uh, the Earth will will not be uh, rotating in a normal way anymore. It'll start faster. It'll be it'll, faster. Wouldn't it'll be it'll be wobbling because it's like a a top that is spinning. Okay, uh, once you add a little bit of weight on one side of the top, it'll start to wobble, and uh, so it will uh, help to speed up the change in the axis or possibly um, a lot of movement of the plate so that we can achieve um, stability once again. And therefore, there'll be a lot of um, earthquakes and so on. Now, if we can all send out a lot of love, if we serve our fellow human beings, this love energy is far greater than any other energy. And with a lot of love, plants will grow, forests will come back very quickly, uh, and therefore the temperature will go down again. Okay. You talked about plants. I think there was an experiment you did yes. with students who yes. planted one side of a paddy field and normal planters did their job. Yes. And the students did it with a lot of love, chanting, Gayatri, and so on and so forth. Yes. And can you tell us the result of that experiment? Well, we, we showed very clearly that the plants that received love would grow better, faster, uh, giving more um, uh, rice than ever before. Uh, actually, I did a, a very um, controlled experiment at Chulalongkorn University a few years back uh, where we grew uh, like marigold plants. Okay, One plot, we send love to it. Another plot, we did not. But we give equal amount of water. We control very carefully the environment. Uh, so the temperature is the same. Everything is the same. in uh, The same amount of sunlight and so on. And uh, the the plot that received love grew and grew, started to flower. Okay. How was the love given? Uh, the love was was given by the students themselves. They come, okay, and then they start to pray. Uh, they said, "May the plants uh, be well and happy, and so on." And they actually, what they do is to radiate l uh, light, love in the form of light to the plants, so that the plants are full of light. Okay, That's how they, they radiate their love. A mental radiation, and mental, vocal as well? Yes, uh, mental radiation, um, imagining. You, you use your imagination to help in the radiation of that love, of energy. It's really light, and they uh, simply imagine that light covering the plants uh, uh, in one plot, but not in the other plot. And, and when, the result? When we measured the height, the, the one that received love was 49.2% uh, taller than, on the average, uh, than the other plot. And the plot that received love had a lot of flowers, okay, every plant had flowers, whereas the other plot, they did not have flower yet. Okay, so it's a complete 
uh, completely different. Uh, you can see a lot of difference. How much of this love is transmitted through the education and human values programs that you do? I believe there are 57 countries with 30 or 57 schools with 35 countries yes, at the moment. Mm -hmm. And in Thailand, you have already trained 60,000 teachers for EHV classes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how much has this changed your life as one who's fully involved in it and those who are thoroughly involved in doing it? Well, you can see a lot of love flowing amongst the children. They're so loving. The teachers are more loving, okay? Uh, and parents are also transforming. So we have a general change, not only in the school. The school is um, full of peace, full of love, uh, teachers and children and parents. Uh, but the parents are outside the school. So it's spreading outside the school. And once we start to train teachers in other uh, school, colleges and so on, they they're a little bit transformed as well. Okay, there's a little bit more love coming. People who come and visit the school, they receive that atmosphere of love. They take it back with them. So really there's a, a general change taking place uh, amongst the uh, school system uh, in, in the country. And of course it will take some time. The children will grow up. They will become uh, our future citizens that are full of love. So really we can observe that love that is taking place. What um, sort of curriculum do they go under? Um, in order to, to create love and the human values, okay, because love is the basis of all the five human values. Um, love, Satya, Dharma, Shanti, yes. Prema, Ahimsa. Yes, uh, because love in action is right conduct. Um, uh, love in in our mind, you get a lot of peace, okay, uh, and you also have ahimsa because that is love. You don't hurt anybody, and once you have love, you raise the consciousness higher, and you get to the truth. Um, so love is the basis of all the uh, five human values. Um, so. Uh, what what was it you were asking? What is in the curriculum to teach them this? Oh, because um, they go to normal school, as opposed to going <coughs> to a Satya Sai school. In a Satya Sai school, we also uh, teach in accordance with the curriculum of the country, because we you follow have, the syllabus from the yes. We have to use the same syllabus so that we can take the children to the universities eventually. They need to have university So education. academically they're at par, they don't lose out anything. That's correct. But the difference is that we integrate values into all subjects. So values are part of the syllabus, um, which we follow, of course, the, the national syllabus. But the difference is the values that are, are there constantly. Can you give an example which the audience listening to this program can <clears> understand? <throat> yes. Um, well, for example, we can integrate values into mathematics, into science, into all the subjects uh, very simply. Uh, take, for example, if you want mathematics, you have 32 divided by 8. What does that equal to? Well, the teacher will simply add a little bit They'll say, my mother loves me very much. Uh, she took me to the market. And because of her love for me, she bought 32 apples for me. On that day, I went back home and seven of my friends came to visit me. And I remember my teacher teaching me to share, to give. So I decided to share the 32 apples with my seven friends and myself, making eight people, we're going to share equally. So um, I have 32 apples, I share with eight people, that's 32 divided by eight. So it's equal to four. So we give four apples to everyone, including myself. Now that is an example where we have integrated love of the mother, sharing, giving with our friends, okay, so a lot of values are added onto the 
32 divided by 8. And we can do this with any subject, with any, any um, mathematical problems or science problems, uh, no problem. You churned out 60,000 teachers in a very Buddhist country, Thailand, for yes. example. Have you had any problems from the clergy? At first, they were suspicious what we were, what we were doing. Okay. But then, uh, as we continue, they feel that we are doing a good job. We are helping people to understand the truth, to uh, become more devout Buddhist, and so on. And finally, the, uh, the, the Buddhist Association of Thailand, they gave us a prize as the most outstanding Buddhist school in Thailand. Okay. Amongst how many schools is that? Well, we have uh, some um, 40,000 schools in Thailand. That's no mean achievement. Yes. And um, actually, I was given the, the, the uh, award also as the best Buddhist teacher <laughs> in, in Thailand. Um, this is in, at, a, at a school level. Okay. So they've also given us so many prizes, awards, um, as being an innovative school, school with innovation in teaching and so on. So they've been very interested and it's partly because of all our effort that uh, when they drafted the new constitution uh, in Thailand, um, they've added the clause that uh, the, the government must make sure that education must contain human values. Okay. That's very it's part part of our constitution. It's never been there before. It's never been there before, but now it's in the constitution. So the whole country now has to uh, develop courses with human values. That is why we are in great demand. People want to come and visit our school. They come. We have over 200 visitors per week uh, coming to visit our school. Uh, to see how we do it, how we integrate values, how we transform children and teachers, uh, and they take back um, what they have learned, um, because it's now become law, uh, especially part of the constitution. Uh, and we also have an education uh, bill, which uh, indicated very clearly that we must integrate values, that we must bring out the values from the children, uh, we must help them to be transformed. You remind me of Dr. Victor Krishnakanu, whose school was awarded a medical school prize in France while you're doing something at various levels in Thailand itself. What I'm reminded of him is that he had to sacrifice, sell his house to set up a school in Zambia. Did you have to go through that sort of trauma? Um, no, not really. Um, because uh, in Thailand, the whole organization decided that the national seva is education. Okay, So everybody helps. Um, the whole country, all the centers in Thailand, they all come and help with education. Uh, we decide we're going to train teachers. So everybody comes and help. Uh, some may uh, cook food, some may uh, donate some money, or some will sweep the floor, clean up, or do the stage, and so on. But they all come and work, okay? And we arrange this uh, with various centers, so we go all over Thailand uh, arranging training. That is how we were able to uh, train 60,000 60, no mean uh, number teachers yes does it uh, uh, you face the criticism that you're sort of churning out factory like you know 60,000 people come and they go are they really imbued in the skills of teaching these values um, we done a lot of research okay uh, people they listen to us then they um, evaluate what we have given to them and we ask, uh, you know, we try to find out if they were transformed, were they touched, um, are they going to be using this in, in their school. Okay. And we received um, 
uh, about 90% of all the people, they were touched, they were moved, and they feel that they really moved to, to do something in their school, they want to change their school, and so on. So we, we get that evaluation from, from the teachers, and um, because of that, we also observe that all these schools, they want to come and see the Satya Sai school. They come study more, they want to study, they want to see what's going on. Uh, so they learn from us, uh, not just once, but they come again uh, and again. And I had to travel around the country also because they keep on inviting me to go to their schools and so on to give them further guidance. Do the Buddhist clergy tell you anything? Um, well, they've in, they've invited me to help train the clergy. Also, <laughs> I give talks to novices. I give talk to to Buddhist monks, um, uh, and we have a Buddhist university run by the clergy, the monks themselves, and uh, I've become one of their lecturers, uh, helping in the training of monks. Do they ask you questions about Swami at all? Any queries? Well, most of the Buddhists, um, some leading Buddhists, are saying that um, uh, Swami is a Bodhisattva. That is in the Bud Buddhist tradition where um, people are incarnated to help the world. Okay, And so they believe you know, they have not said he is a Buddha, but uh, they have said that he is a Bodhisattva, um, where he they incarnate from time to time to help the world. Um, they are also looking towards the coming of the Maitri Buddha. Yes. The, the final Buddha to come is Maitri Buddha. To me, Maitri Buddha is already here. Yes. Shirdi Sai Baba the first, second is Satya Sai Baba the third, my three Buddhas. Yes, my three Buddhas. Yes. That's how I look at it. Yes, very good. Yes. So you have cut through the uh, clergy and all the customary requirements of Thailand, of course, including government requirements. Now we go to a, the opposite side of the world, the Muslim world, which is not easy to break through. How do you manage to break the walls of Kazakhstan, of United Arab Emirates, of uh, Saudi Arabia, and, and Indonesia forever? I mean, for the sake of our audiences, it would be very fascinating to hear that part of how you manage to take the Sai message of values? Well, um, really, there is an inner awakening uh, from every side, everybody throughout the world. Um, but you have to go through a lot of dramas. <laughs> uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, um, it was through a medical doctor who's in, in Ridyard. He is uh, working there, a Danish gentleman, and he happened to have a um, very bad illness of cancer, and he, was, he had terminal cancer. And this uh, medical doctor um, in Saudi Arabia felt that before he dies, he wants to bring human values. He's a devotee, so he wants to bring human values, uh, Swami's teachings, into Saudi Arabia. He's a Muslim by No, no, by he's, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. He's okay. a Christian, but um, in Saudi Arabia, they allow medical doctors, they allow people to go and work there, uh, and they have a big hospital there where all the Saudi princes, they go and get treatment and so on. So he's a well-known person, he's well accepted in Saudi Arabia, uh, but only for his medical work. Okay. But his last wish was to bring human values into the country. Uh, so um, he contacted me, said, we would like to invite you to come and bring um, uh, my, my colleagues, Dr. Judo and Sister Lorraine Burrus. Okay to Saudi Arabia. So I said, yes, we, will, we are happy to go. He said he will arrange everything, he will arrange the visas and so on. Well, as it happens, the, the Saudi Arabia government, they, didn't want, they don't want interference from outside. 
they're very careful. They have religious police where they watch very carefully that no other religions will will come in. Okay, and um, so what happens was that um, they did not give us the visa. They would not give the visa. They said there's no need to to have any training of any sort, and. Uh, the medical doctor felt very sad. Uh, he told me, sorry, we have to cancel the whole um, training. Uh, but you can see Swami's Leela, that um, at that time I happened to be uh, the secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And it was very strange. Swami has always been saying, you go into politics, uh, which is very unusual. He will tell other people, don't, don't, go, <laughs> don't go into politics, you see. But uh, with me, there was an exception. He has encouraged me to play politics. So I did, and um, I had that position at that time. Were you in parliament? Yes, I was in parliament. I was a member of parliament. That's why I, was, I had that position of secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's part of the political job. Um, so I went to the Saudi Arabian embassy and being secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, if I ask for visa, they will give, okay? Um, and they did give. They gave me visas to go. Um, myself and Dr. Judo were allowed to go, okay? Um, so we went. We went to Saudi Arabia. and. Uh, the first meeting we had with the authorities, they warned us that we're not allowed to talk about values, we're not allowed to talk about uh, religion, we cannot touch Islam, you cannot bring Hinduism or Buddhism or any other religion. I believe you were given a very thick book of don'ts. Yes, they, they send that earlier on, okay, but uh, at that meeting they didn't give us an, another book uh, because we already received it, okay. So, um, um i said yes okay we'll we'll try to abide by by the rules and so we started that training the following day and i was very scientific okay uh, i used science uh, mostly to bring the values um that is already in science and um didn't give one example so the audiences can remember this um well, I, I started to talk about, um, for example, information technology. Okay. In information technology, uh, and I gave the example of the computer, uh, you put in signal uh, in there, you, you type something out, then uh, immediately the computer will search for similar information uh, from the memory, compare with what we have put in, if there's already some program there, it will recognize what we have put in. Then it will work on it, and information will appear in, on on the monitor. Okay, but if there's no information available, then uh, then the computer will say, "We don't recognize that. What is this? What are you putting in?" And so on. See, so it's the same with ourselves. When we see something, okay, it's only um, a form of electromagnetic energy that enters our eyes. In order to recognize what we see, we have to use the same technology. That is, we have to go and search for something in our memory, compare with what we have received. Then we can interpret what we have received, and then we understand. This is information technology that is working right inside ourselves. And uh, so I continue to explain in that way. Uh, for example, when we listen to something, it's only vibration of air. So if somebody swears at us, why should we get upset? Because it's only vibration of oxygen, 
uh, molecules of oxygen, molecules of nitrogen, molecules of carbon dioxide. Uh, there's nothing to it. So when people uh, abuse us, say something bad at us, from now on we just smile. We say it's only vibration of air. So there's no more garbage in, garbage out. That's right. Um, what Then I explain, of course, that what happens is that when we receive information through the eyes, through the ears, through the five senses, what we do is to go and retrieve data from our memory. So what we have stored in the past will affect our interpretation of the message. So if we watch uh, a lot of um, negativity on television, uh, people killing one another, fighting and quarrel, quarreling, all this will be stored in our memory. Which Swami calls telepoison. Yes. So and also the memory is vasana, isn't it, from your previous births? Well, uh, I don't go into that uh, okay. in Saudi Arabia. Of course, of course. That There's will get, no get me into difficulty. Head decapitation, I explain say. that whatever we receive from outside, we store in our memory. And therefore, when we receive something new, we also retrieve from the old memory and we interpret it. Okay? So if we've seen a lot of violence in the past, then violence will come out and we'll interpret this in a violent way. We start to become angry, we start to get upset, we want to fight other people. So the process of helping people is to put in positive things. Um, we put in things that will help them to interpret information in a good way. Okay. So all this is very scientific, the whole thing. Okay. Um, and when I gave my talk for three hours, the teachers who were Muslim, they were crying. They were, said, they were saying, this is exactly what we need for our country. Okay, they they accept it. They 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 want they wanted more, so that paved the way for Dr. Judo in the afternoon, and he talked um, uh, about the role of the teachers and so on, and it was well accepted by everyone. So the message seems to go through Muslim countries like Indonesia, Kazakhstan, yes, and also the Emirates, yes. But you did say that forty percent of Mexico have adopted. Psi values in education. That's amazing. Yes. Uh, well, you know, it's a job of the avatar <laughs> to to do all this, to transform the world. And we are preparing for that critical mass so that one day the whole world would change and there would be peace in the world. Okay. So things are really happening everywhere. Uh, yes, um, um, many students from Mexico, teachers from Mexico have come to Thailand and they were trained. Okay, uh, They went back, they did a lot of good job everywhere, uh, wherever they, they, they come from. In fact, in uh, South America as a whole, uh, there's a lot of activities in Satyasai education there. Um, they have more Satyasai schools than any part of the world. Uh, in South America. They're very active people, uh, working hard. Um, we have um, six or seven schools in, in Brazil alone, and springing up in Colombia, in Venezuela, in Chile, in Argentina, Paraguay, uh, everywhere. So many countries are, are now very active in education in uh, South America. Thank you, Dr. Jumsai. But just to explain your name, Jumsai, you said, is a family name, meaning unity. Each Sai organization you go and talk to, they talk about, Bhagwan, of course, talks about unity before purity, before attaining divinity. There doesn't seem to be much of unity amongst so-called senior brethren of Sai organizations. What's your advice to them? I've already explained to to everyone that when we come into the Sai organization, okay, Swami will then work on us by quickening the karma. And in order to 
when if you're going to quicken the karma, it means all the negative things will come out. Okay, so they're being brought out, so that we can change more quickly, so that we recognize the divinity that is within us. So what's happening around the world is that the the quickening of the karma amongst the uh, Sai brethrens. That means they start to quarrel. They start to have a lot of uh, difficulties here and there, a lot of obstacles, because Swami is working on them and testing them. And uh, it's a natural process where some will also fall by the wayside. It's, uh, the, it's the uh, sorting of the wheat from the shaft, uh, which Swami mentioned in the, on the 60th birthday, that he's now doing that uh, around the world. So this explains why uh, there seem to be a lot of problems within the organization itself, but it's only for the good. And finally, the organization will shine and will be the example for everybody else. Um, uh, after a little bit of trials and uh, problems and workshops that, that we all have to go through. In a minute or so that we have got left, can you leave a positive message to those who have listened to you for the past hour? You know, there's only one thing in the world that we need, and that is love. Uh, we don't need anything else. Love is enough. If we love one another, if we love everybody, we love um, the whole world, animals, plants, the world will change overnight. Certainly it will change for us. When we start to love everyone, then we feel tremendous peace, joy, happiness, and we are also radiating this love to others, people around us will also feel a lot of peace, a lot of joy and happiness, and they will continue. It will expand, it will change, uh, and very soon we'll have complete peace in the world. So this is something that I, I would love to have everybody be filled with peace, with love all the time. So the message is love. Om Sairam. Sairam. Sairam.